thanks for everyone being here and also my thanks for the KI Echo Center being so welcoming to our new doctoral program at the School of Education at IUPUI where you've heard several of the students here. We, we're in our second cohort and we're picking our third cohort right now. Uh, we've been developing this collaborative relationship with KI Echo Center so that um, our students get integrated with the idea that the university should not be separate from the community that it serves and that we should be working in a collaborative way in whatever research that we're doing rather than the university deciding what research is doing. And that's the basis of the relationship we've had here. Khalil and Paulette and and all the other folks that work here have been very welcoming to us in that collaboration. Today I'm going to just say a few things about the book and then I'm going to turn it over to these two young men and they're, they're going to get into it. Um, the research that's covered, and there's a lot of research covered in the new Jim Crow, she didn't, uh, Michelle Alexander, she didn't do that research. What she did is collected the research. So what she's talking about isn't her own work. And what she's talking about has been talked about by a lot of other people. The thing that's different about the book is I think she put it together in a very compelling way. Uh, I think when she started working, I believe she's a lawyer uh, and a professor. And when she started working uh, with these issues around law enforcement, imprisonment, and African American men, she didn't have the view that she currently has. You know, she was had kind of the typical view of that we hear in society in general that it's. But as she began to work with this issue and she began to read more research she realized that something else was going on here. And that, for example, uh, white folks and black folks use drugs at about the same rate. There's plenty of research on that. But it's African Americans, and particularly African American males, who are targeted by law enforcement at huge rates. I mean, most of the, we have one of the highest prison rates in the world. And most of that, the increase that's happened over the last few decades has been focused on African American males. That's where we got our huge increase. And it's around drug enforcement, and most of it's around marijuana. And um, even though marijuana use itself is a little higher among the white population, but they're not getting targeted. So, Many people think that all this started with the crack epidemic, and it didn't. It started before the crack epidemic. And it was driven by the discomfort of conservative forces in this country with the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement was starting to change the nature of relationships among whites and folks of color. And people with investment in the status quo started to get very nervous and were looking for ways to, uh, in a sense, reestablish Jim Crow because they were losing it. And Jim Crow and was of economic benefit to whites in power. And so, you know, I, they tried several things, but the one that really worked was this focus on the dangerous black male, the unlawful black male, and they started instigating different government programs. They were able to sell that idea beyond conservatives till now it's kind of socially accepted. But she looks into all of this and shows that this has nothing to do with any problem with black males. This has to do with white racism, white supremacy, the economic dominance of whites. And she does all this in a very compelling, very, it's a really thorough, well-researched book. But all that's abstract, you know, and so I'm now going to 
turned over to these two young men here who are living amidst this themselves. Go ahead, y'all. Well, my name is Russell Palmer. I'm the intern to Cayuga Center. I'm 17 years old. And first off, well, I'll go in there. I'm going to introduce yourself here. I'm going to go ahead and continue. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, first off here, I'm going to talk about blog and created based off reading this book called Jim Crow. It's named The New and Old Jim Crow and What's the Difference? It's a compare and contrast essay. I created an assignment. So I'm just going to read it off to you here. Okay. I'm going to explain the tenets and the similarities and the difference between the new and old Jim Crow. Okay, first I talk about the old Jim Crow, the tenets of the old Jim Crow. The old Jim Crow was a racial caste system that was used in the United States, largely in the southern area, large in the southern regions, like Texas, Mississippi, Kentucky. All the southern regions during the 1870s. Under this system, African Americans were given second class status by laws that directly and indirectly stripped the black of African Americans, particularly males, of their rights. Jim Crow was a rationalized was rationalized by the belief that whites were superior to blacks in every way and, you know, and that Jim Crow laws were needed for both whites, whites and blacks on good. Jim Crow encouraged violence to maintain the racial hierarchy and the social etiquette that kept blacks in the second class. And the tenets of the new Jim Crow are, the new Jim Crow creates an anti-black undercast Oh, uh, sorry, creates an end, sorry, excuse me. The new Jim Crow creates a black undercast through the United States criminal justice system. Since the 1970s, war on drugs, discriminatory laws, and police practices have caused the prison population to grow exponentially, <coughs> targeting African-American males in particular. Once a person is branded a criminal, they lose most of their rights, most of their rights. The new Jim Crow makes it legal for businesses, businesses to discriminate against ex-convicts when applying for employment, housing, or food stamps. By losing such basic rights, the person is thrown into a same class status for the rest of their life. The similarities. Both the new and old Jim Crow were made to create a same class within the United States. The main victims targeted by the new and old Jim Crow are mainly black, both use fear and violence and imprisonment as a means to keep control of the undercast and takes away rights and property. Jim Crow uses laws to legitimize and impose white supremacy on society. The main purpose of the Jim Crow is to con con concentrate the money and power in the, perma in the predominantly white middle class and elite classes. The differences are the main differences between the old and new Jim Crow are the ways to achieve their goal. The methods of the new old Jim Crow were more explicit involving outright attacks on African Americans without covering up racist attitudes. Individuals and groups who speak out, who spoke out against Jim Crow were threatened, lynched, and murdered to keep the system running. The methods of the new Jim Crow, however, are more discreet and, and pervasive. Fueled by, racial stereotypes, fueled by racial stereotypes. And there is little political opposition to the system of mass incarceration. And political leaders deliver messages celebrating racial equality while they're not truthfully doing so. The conclusion. The new and old Jim Crow were made to maintain the control of the elite over the blacks and lower classes. The old Jim Crow is obsolete in today's age of colorblindness and New Jim Crow is, a, is an evolved form to thrive in today's realities. Um, it's at um, Kepper, um, it's at Kepper.org. You can go to media and go through blogs and she'll be the most recent one you see.
Is your reference the new Jim Crow book, and or is this your interpretation and your conclusion based on your research? Your the old Jim Crow was from the book and from personal research I did to get a better understanding. Because she speaks. Yeah, she spoke briefly about the old Jim Crow, so I got some research on that. The new Jim Crow was um, mainly for reading the book. Uh, before I get my questions, I would like to talk about my visit to Purdue. Um, my visit to Purdue gave me a reinforced and strong understanding about the person who wrote this book, Michelle Alexander, because when she spoke in the discussion at Purdue, she saw very personal passion and understanding and belief about what she wrote about. But like, you can't tell her that she's wrong. <laughs> you just can't come up to her with that. You you saw her at Purdue. You saw her speaking. Cool. It's really cool. Okay. And uh, now I'm just gonna pass it to my friend Kenan over here. Thank you very much. My name is Keenan Rhodes. I'm an intern for the KI Echo Center. Um, long time intern. I originally came here and uh, well, I've known M Hotep and Miss Paulette since I was about seven and remember running around at the Rehab Resource Center when they, uh, where they used to work. Um, and so I came back this summer because um, I finally had a, a grip, or a, somewhat of an understanding of what they were trying to do for the community. And so I wanted to come back, um, come and give back um, and do whatever I could to support uh, this initiative. And so, well, now that's evolved to uh, me staying at the dorm. So, I mean, it's quite an experience uh, still being a senior in high school and managing it too, but um, it's been great so far. And so, um, I also wrote a blog uh, like Russell, and mine was um, more of a self-reflection, so I'll just go ahead and read it. Uh, for the past month, I've been reading The New Jim Crow, a book by Michelle Alexander about the system of oppression that imprisons disproportionate numbers of African American men and converts them into second class citizens upon release. This book discusses the system by explaining the complexity of the racism of the legal system. As a young black man, reading this book has been unsettling. Alexander's collection of facts and statistics clearly reveal racism that I thought had subsided. The new Jim Crow has made me realize that I've been wearing blindfolders that blurred my vision of institutionalized racism, a system of written and unwritten laws, unspoken rules, and social norms that target me, my family, and my community. Institutionalized racism reinforces white privilege, keeping whites at the top at the expense of, other bl of blacks and other people of color. Though racism takes a different form than in my grandparents' days, through this book, I've discovered that it takes different um, that it takes another form that is prevalent in our society through microaggressions and the threat of being arrested because of discriminatory laws and police practices. One of the most disheartening stories that I've heard from this book about the insens insensitivity of the legal system and the power it gives to its enforcers was the story of Madhu Diallo. In February 1999, Diallo was a 23-year-old African-American living in New York City. Police surrounded him outside of his apartment. He took out his wallet out of his jacket. He took his wallet out of his jacket, which the police mistook for a gun. They fired 41 shots at him. It hit him 19 times, and all officers involved in the shooting were acquitted and faced no charges. This tragedy shows the danger that we face. The fact that a black man can be brutally murdered by authority and without significant ramifications is alarming and is very alarming. The story was worldwide at the time it occurred, but I was never told about it in school books, and most of my people, of most people my age, uh, have no idea that it happened. Now I walk around with a fear when I'm walking down the street that someone will view me as dangerous and try to hurt me. I experience a similar fear at Park Tudor, an elite private school, where I feel the need to dress and act a certain way so that I don't appear as a threat to my white classmates and teachers. One of the worst realizations that I've had is the impact that this system has had on my thoughts. This includes 
the way that I speak to people and including the way that I communicate with my family and also the way I view my own people. Following this discovery comes the question of what we need to do about it. One of the first steps is to have discussions about this complex racism. And other steps, including, it includes building organized resistance against this system so that we can build a world that is humane and just for all people. Thank you. Um, Thursday, when Rasul uh, M., Ms. Fair, Pamban, and I went to Purdue to uh, visit Michelle Alexander, um, I guess the main thing that I took from it, well, the impact that it gave me was that it put a voice behind the words. And so I wasn't reading a collection of, um, I wasn't just reading a collection of facts. It put the passion um, into the book, which gave it a different feel for me. Um, in a field that was much more impactful. And so, um, so I guess now we'll transition into uh, the actual book itself. I'll be covering the introduction and a section of chapter one, and Russell will finish off the chapter. And so, the introduction begins with the story of with uh, the story of a man named Jarvis Cotton. Jarvis Cotton. Um, she begins with this young man because he is a felon. One of, an example of the new, uh, under, you know, an example of um, the new undercaste system. During the days of Jim Crow, his great, great, great grandfather could not vote. And so now, all of these years later, you still see that those same rights of being a citizen have been stripped. But now the label is no longer, the label that you get is no longer the same. The label is now being a felon, being a supposed criminal. So she continues, well that's the way she starts the instruction. She continues with her own story of how she got started, um, or how her awakening came about, which was, one day she was taking the bus and she saw an orange sign that said, the war on drugs is the new Jim Crow. And so seeing that sign kind of enacted her to learn more about what she just saw. So she uh, started to gather a little bit more research on it to further expand upon these thoughts that she, well, to further expand upon um, what she saw and she came to that conclusion that yes, the sign was right. Um, the war on drugs um, and the criminal justice system is the new Jim Crow. And uh, one of the ironic things is that it was, well not necessarily ironic, but that um, this war on drugs was established after the civil rights movement. And so it was a way that you could continue to discriminate against people. Now, of course, the war on drugs was created, um, well, it's supposedly colorblind. However, the focus that it took was on uh, poor black communities and it targeted young African American men. And so, another thing that she, that she uh, mentions in the introduction is how the criminal justice system is being overlooked by black leaders. And so, when I asked about the intentions that all these uh, black organizations are going to do, uh, criminal justice was nowhere on the list. And so, um, the fact that the criminal justice system is being overlooked by black leaders, it further perpetuates the idea that we are um, blind to the system. And so she then proceeds to talk about how she's the splitting up of the book, chapter one exploring the racial caste system of the new Jim Crow and the systematic control of black people, 
Chapter two, dealing with the war on drugs. Chapter three, how the colorblindness of the laws, um, well, although the laws themselves are colorblind, that they're, how they're enforced um, has a racial bias towards them. With chapter four being how the caste system operates um, upon release from prison. Chapter five, with the comparison between mass incarceration and Jim Crow. And chapter six, what acknowledging the presence of the new Jim Crow means for our society. So, chapter one, okay, so, my apologies, I have a little bit of technology wrong. But, um, chapter one basically begins by explaining the, uh, by explaining the system of slavery in this country. And so, she explains that slavery uh, it's in itself was a caste system with African American slaves or well, African slaves um, doing all the work and being less than human, being treated as property and being treated as animals. And so um, then she then she continues on and says, well, talks about the time after uh, 1770 when we became our own country and how the Constitution itself was written so that it can continually and uh, justify the system of slavery. And so, you know, slavery was very profitable and it fueled the economy of um, the United States. And so, around 1860, the Civil War began, you know, in response to you know, of course, the abolitionist movement, the slave revolts, and um, the, you know, the uh, persistence of the North trying to get rid of slavery in the entire country, and the South resisting that because of all of its benefits. And, you know, upon release, if you release all the slaves, then they become equal citizens, which is what we saw after, for a brief period of time, after the Civil War ended. And so then she continues with saying that the Jim Crow uh, system was created in response to the freedom of all of these slaves who now had equal, or supposed to equal rights, uh, who were socially equal to um, all of the whites. And so Jim Crow was a way that they could continually control African American citizens in every aspect of life. And so, then she continues on to um, talking about the segregation laws and how they you know, continuously affected the citizens. And um, thus, the, in around 1940s, 1950s, um, the death of the Jim Crow laws, um, which Russell here will talk about. Okay. The, um, the death, after the um, death of Jim Crow reached his peak, um, many civil rights leaders and black activists, such as Martin Luther King and others, etc., a civil rights movement was starting to go from a racial issue to a um, <coughs> socio-economic issue that is that would cross um, racial borderlines and appeal to many other types of classes and races. Um, racial the racial attitude towards blacks was starting to dissipate, and Jim Crow's power to keep Jim Crow's power to keep the civil rights movement was starting to lose its hold. As it was starting to move from just appealing to African Americans by going for like a sense of rights was going towards instead of aiming directly as race as the main issue, it was aiming at social or economic issues primarily. So it was appealing to more than just white, I mean from black, African American, poor class. It was also appealing to um, um, low um, white working class. So it was gaining more support politically through white working class people and was starting to expand its power. And through that, the, the Jim Crow was starting to lose its hold and its reason by using um, racial attitudes as its means to keep control. Since more and more white and more and more um, 
more of the white population was starting to go and support the um, white, I mean, going to support the um, civil rights movement. So the Democrat, so for the, also for the census for the Republican Party also, and the federal support, the death of Jim Crow was, was um, inevitable in his end. Um, um, starting, uh, starting from that, the new, the birth of mass incarceration, after a couple, of, after a few decades of the loss of Jim Crow, many Southern Democrats and police officers down in the South was trying to put a new face on the civil rights movement as the reason for the increase in crime rates in the United States. They were trying to give it a new face, trying to make it seem like that's a problem. And through doing so, many white Democratic conservatives and politicals were starting to build this new rhetoric, new type of language to put on this political party. Since that's the new, since that's the new, that explicit racial attitudes, and um, let me rephrase that. They knew the old Jim Crow was was dead. They could not bring it back. They were trying to find a new way to keep the status quo in the same place it was before and keep it stable without using the old method you used before, you used before. So they knew the old rhetoric of racial attitudes as saying black African Americans through unrational type of means was not gonna cut anymore. So through political means they started using crime, um, implicit type of words to put on African Americans or the civil as a reason for increased crime rates within the United States. Through doing so, they all, um, many um, democratic political start grinding a hole through the political progress of the <coughs> civil rights movement. Okay. Um, after a couple of years, um, and the new, in the beginning of the Great Depression, it helped um, exacerbate that issue. The Great Depression created a new realignment of political, political parties in the United States. The, um, during that time, during the Great Depression, thanks to um, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the New Deal programs, um, which appealed to African Americans as well as the lower white class, whites in the North and the South, who was affected by the Great Depression, and, um, it, the, the Democratic Party saw this as an opportunity to gain support from both. They, ne they needed the support of white and black to help move the political agenda. A lot of, but still, a lot of white working classes and elites did not find that, found it, did not like that. Their political party they worked, hard, worked so hard to support was changing its type ideological view in the entire scenario. So the Republicans saw this as an opportunity to gain a new majority for the political party since they were the minority. So, in, so as time went on, the political party, the Republicans, when Nixon in the 19, going to the 1920s and 1960s, Nixon, the Nixon administration, and so forth, so it's an opportunity to grant a new party. So they still bid on this. Um, they still bid on the idea of crime. Not all. Uh, they didn't lose. Excuse me. I'm trying to get my words together. <coughs> this is a lot here. They did. <laughs> this is a lot. They did not. They went from disintegration which was a hot topic right then, the situation, busing, economic. They moved all the way from that, all the equality and social issues to law and order. As crime rates were starting to still increase within the United States across the board, the Republicans saw this as, a, um, as an opportunity to gain a new majority through the United States by appealing to the um, elite and lower white classes who feared and hated the new political ideas that um, civil rights movement was starting to make. So at first, the Nixon administration started this law uh, order campaign by showing, by using the mass media and speeches, et cetera, to show this image of not just blacks, but a lot of ethnic groups as the means of the, as the reason for the major crime increase in the United States and incarceration increase. <laughs> Sorry, this is a lot to put it out there. <clears throat> so through the Nixon administration, through the Nixon administration, through the mass media, 
um, Nixon's main advisor saw Nixon's idea based on this. He put this in paraphrase. He paraphrased Nixon's idea. No matter how you look at this, the African Americans or blacks are the main issue here. So he used his opportunity to appeal to the low and class whites by showing mass media imagery by showing by um, ignoring or putting up laws that appeal to them. A lot of um and one of the um ideas he thought of is the new drugs, the drug war. A new drug war that was started mainly in the nineteen 1971 to 1973, when he was still president. Nixon started this new drug on marijuana, which was starting to um, pop up thanks to the baby boom incident, where a new generation of 23-year-olds, um, etc., 23-year-olds, youth, and young people starting to pop up. He used this opportunity through the huge increase with generation grab and new upheaval of new drug to um, move his political agenda by pointing out this new drug issue and using African Americans or any other low ethnic group as the main image of this drug issue. After that, Jimmy Carter, uh, a lot of uh, researchers and other political parties tried to show him that marijuana, decriminalizing marijuana would be beneficial in this drug issue to help, men, to help mitigate this drug issue. He ignored all the uh, appeals or proposals. I got nervous. Thank you guys. You don't do that. Thanks. Thank you guys. Afterwards, Jimmy Carter was um, also a person who was trying to, by the time Jimmy Carter was in office, 11 states decriminalized marijuana because he knew it wasn't a big problem as much was. So, Jimmy Carter was trying to do Jim McCarthy didn't do too much, actually. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even do too much different than what Nixon was doing. He just, just followed the same boat as in his office. When Ronald, Reagan, when Ronald Reagan got to office, that's when everything went off the board. <laughs> everything skyrocketed when Ronald, when Ronald Reagan got into office. He poured millions, among billions of dollars, into the drug war, adding new drugs like crack cocaine into the scenario. Ronald Reagan was offering money, so this new drug war was giving federal money to states and states and community um, police departments to find and arrest drug offenders. And this new law, whew, and this new law, new legislations dictated that first time drug offenders would get a year, would get a like, lifetime sentence in prison. Prior to that, it was just a year's worth, uh, one year, for a drug offense. Okay. Oh. <sighs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is a lot here. Okay. When I rang got an office, everything went off the board. He started to, basically he started doing the same thing that Nixon does. Along that line, he just went for a tenfold, started throwing billions among billions of dollars into mass media imagery and the federal uses, using the military at times in the drug war. Through the mass media, he showed images, images of African Americans as drug addicts, um, drug babies, mothers being drug addicts as well. Mainly using African Americans as an image. To give, it, to give um, a new stereotype to drug war for its political agenda. For doing so, and through um, throwing more and more funding into state and uh, state police and government police, mass incarceration skyrocketed as the African Americans as the main target. For, and also, for the um, for efforts of the um, civil rights movement to um, go against this, he threw more imagery as uh, some civil rights activists as trying to um, lighten up the laws against drug offenders. So the idea of more tough laws started, this um, theme of tough laws started to occur. As future presidents and so forth started the idea 
I throw in more and more tougher laws onto drug offenders by longer sentences, more punishment, and more laws and basic rights being removed from doing so. And um, that's that's where I got, and that's um, I believe that's the end of chapter. I'm asking the chapter one. <laughs> I, I got excited. <laughs> so we'll uh, open up for questions. Uh, can you maybe serve as a facilitator of questions? Pass the ball around to your colleagues there. And I'd like to encourage the audience to try to keep the commentary minimal uh, and try to focus on asking questions uh, and, just, uh, and even some challenging questions to the young men and folks who put it in. Thought. So without any further ado, uh, any questions? Yes, Denise. Um, what benefits are obtained by the privileged class by oppressing folks under the old and or the new Jim Crow? You want to answer that? Answer that. Answer that. Yeah. I think it'll probably be best. Yours. You're below the kind of answer, Dennis. Okay. Go ahead. Um, through the old Jim Crow, the beneficiaries the middle, um, the middle elite class, they tried, the entire structure of the social and national system required <coughs> an undercast. The middle elite class was working and providing money for the upper elite class. That's how it went. For, but, let me try to give you a better understanding. Through slavery, the lower working white classes rebelled against the elite classes, story slavery. To do to prevent that, to prevent that, um, the elite classes pointed to slaves, African Americans, as the reasons for their troubles, to diverge their attention from themselves. And the Jim Crow, the entire theme is basically the same. Through making the middle elite class view as African Americans as a problem, and the middle elite class views themselves as superior over themselves, it diverged attention from the elite classes who are the main power brokers of the entire system. So for Jim Crow, for the old Jim Crow, the Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws were made to keep the African Americans in that inferior type of light through the um, middle class's eyes. <coughs> Why is it because there's not enough uh, labor, <coughs> not enough jobs? Is it totally economically based? Why would that be happening? Um, African Americans are many. Um, why would be happening? Why do um, middle class feel them that way, or why the elite class do that? Why, in general, do um, societies oppress one group of folks? Why do they do it? Is it because they need the cheap labor? Is there because there's not enough? Jobs in the economy. It's possibly a multitude or it's probably a multitude of reasons because I know the United States is not the only place that made it uncast. Like India for some has its own caste system to do so. But in the United States, I imagine my understanding, caste systems are made to maintain a power system. A status quo to maintain a certain amount of power and control. Like a hierarchy. Certain amount of hierarchies have more control and influence over no another. And the middle class was sort of the buffer between the elite class and the lower class. The elite um, African, the lower African American class, from the get go, were in charge doing the managerial labors back then, like in slavery, the old Jim Crow, were made to do, do things that the middle elite class did not, could not do. The middle elite class were made to do things, were made to work in like, um, I don't know how to answer that part, but the middle elite class were made to do the whole thing. The elite class was the mean class. The elite class stood at the top of the pyramid by controlling where does the money and power go. That's what they usually did. It involved the elite class or the lower class. If there were no, if there wasn't no African American class, who do you think would be the lower class? The middle class would be the lower class because there's no other lower class. If that would be the case, the middle class would likely do the same thing African Americans have been trying to do for a long time. 
trying to get the equal quote. I'm trying to say equal with the elite class. And the one thing with the elite class, they don't want to be equal with you. That's been the main thing, regardless of what class you are. Stay where you are, I'll stay where I am. So they use these strategies to pit lower white class and African Americans, even though they were both broke at the same time, <laughs> back then, they had them against each other to divert attention from the middle elite class who were mainly in control to the day. By making elite class, viewing the little African Americans as lower, making them feel superior to stay where they are, and viewing African Americans as a problem if things change. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Great, yes. Great answer. Good job. Yeah, I'm going to take that. Okay. Read this book, how does it make you feel as you read it? Alright, so I guess we can, do you want to answer that? I mean, we can both answer it. I, I can answer first, then. You should? Why don't both of you give us your thoughts on that? I mean, yeah, we will. Uh, just uh, bigger and back who goes first. <laughs> but, Russell, you get it. Okay. Your throat's dry. Um, I'll go first. Okay. Um, as far reading this book, it allows, as I was talking about in my vlog, it kind of opened my eyes um, as far as how deep racism goes. Um. Well, I guess the first, this one provided more of a clarification to, it provided a clarification for uh, something that I felt I couldn't answer, that I couldn't put together myself. And so, we all, I always knew that there was something there, you know, why am I look, be, you know, no matter what I do, it seems like I'm always being looked at funny by um, particular groups of people, mainly people that I go to school with. Um, and it seemed to be something that I just, um, that I always knew, but really couldn't put in words. And so what this book did for me was, it was kind of like a giant, aha, you know, that's, that's what I've been feeling this entire time. Now it's right in front of me um, and greatly composed and uh, very clear and thorough, so. So um, since you read the book and, and, and still in the environment um, of the school you attend, how do you interact differently? How do you um, approach situations differently or, or have things changed? Well, one of, the, uh, one of the primary things I'm involved with at school is um, serving as kind of one of, the, well, one of the presidents of the diversity club. And so, I mean, especially since reading this book, I've been making sure that we're trying to push more for, um, during these discussions, having more impact and um, pushing more for equity rather than equality. And so with equality, we were, you know, as a club, we were doing a lot of equality work, which was, you know, everyone's the same. But, you know, although that would be a great place to get to, by saying that, it, it, it ignores the power dynamics of race in America. And so, we had to, so what, that's one of the main things that I've been trying to do. And uh, I had mentioned the book in my club. And it, of course, you know, extra reading doesn't really get reception, great reception <laughs> among teenagers. But uh, I've definitely been trying to push for a different message so that we can have a, um, more profound impact on our school. Um, all right, so well, Russell, you want to answer him's original question? Um, when I read the book, well, before I read the book, I've been working on Canada for like four years now. I'm going on five years. I, I had a like basic inkling that something general was wrong with everything around me. <laughs> <laughs> I do something wrong. <laughs> So, I knew there was probably some, so obviously I assumed there was already something wrong with the justice system and everything else like that. But when I read the Jim Crow book, New Jim Crow, it gave me context and scale to have to look at what really is the problem. When I read how much this New Jim Crow 
is integrated into everything else in the United States and how vital it is. I was like, in terms of NWCP and any other type of organization trying to deal with certain type of issues, we're just picking at the toe, the the toe of the entire problem. I was like, this is big. If we change one, if we do succeed in changing one thing, it may mess up something else entirely. Like for example, if we do end up changing mass incarceration and dealing with the entire unequal incarceration rates in the United States, and country goes down, millions of people are gonna lose their jobs. More than they are now. And a lot of money is gonna be lost too. Oh, mass incarceration building jail is one of the United States' main source of making money. <laughs> so if that goes away, the United States might have to find a new thing to do. So if we fix one problem, there's gonna be new problems to deal with. <laughs> so it's hard to get a grasp around this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. right, Amy, uh, in the back. I just I wonder what, I mean, this is a great example of, to me, don't, don't you think that this is a great example of the power of synthesis and how it's really dangerous in our analysis culture to put ideas together. And the fact that she put those ideas together and created something new that we could really put our hands around. Uh, you know, do you see that? Uh, and ideas are dangerous to put ideas together. I think I got an idea because I believe the people who are managing the system thought of this as well. Because if you, like, um, the idea of abolishing racist, racism terms, everything else from the judicial system, everybody else ignored the idea. But everybody has a hard time applying the idea that the justice system is racist. Try to make an argument for it. By creating a regular, by separating the ideas of racism and justice, no one can put the entire picture together that this time justice system is discriminatory about who it's going to be targeting. At least it's hard to argue against, argue for it. All right, so go in order of hands. One, then Miss, uh, you sir, then Miss Bombana, then. Uh, the lady in the orange sir. jacket. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about uh, microaggressions when you first started your presentation? Oh, she was here last night. When you, um, when you talked about the microaggression, it struck me that it happens a lot in schools because you're connected to schools. What do you think, um, what do you think we need to know more about in terms of what a microaggression is? What, what, do, you, what, do, what do you see it, what do you see it affecting? <coughs> See it affecting? Um, well, what is it? What do you see it affecting? Microaggressions are basically like small nuances that are like very offensive, but not to the. They they usually represent stereotypes, uh, but they're like tiny, small observances that turn into general generalizations. So um, microaggressions being the small observances, and then stereotypes turning into these general observations. And so, I mean, I guess I could give an example of micro, uh, microaggressions would be um, with typical one of African American males. If we're at the lunch table and you see one of us eating fried chicken, then, you know, you say, have some of the white kids kind of look and point their fingers and kind of snicker. Um, like, look, the uh, African Americans are uh, eating chicken again. <laughs> like you know, like that's funny, as if yeah, as if it's you know, as if we're like you know, you know, gazelles, and this is National Geographic. You don't mean to make a bad joke. Make it a good joke, at least. Yeah, it's like, and so, um, so how I see it affecting the, I would say that its impact turns into from shifting, is that shift from microaggressions to the stereotypes? 
And so when you have all these general observations uh, about people in general, then you hold that uh, then you hold that generalization about every single person that you meet um, that may fit into that category. And so, especially with um, the stereotypes that we face, especially as African American, as uh, Russell being both, both of us being uh, young black males, the stereotypes that are against us are very heavy um, and are very dangerous. You know, the fact that we're black, you know, automatically according to stereotypes makes us criminals makes us drug addicts, and people assume that we're automatically up to no good. So um, that's where I see the danger um, that lies in microaggressions. So, uh, you, sir. Oh, you. Yeah. 17? 17. Okay. Uh, I'm too far away. Uh, are you able to communicate to other young people your age about this conversation? And two, um, what percentage of your generation is aware consciously as you are uh, about this? Um, well, <laughs> to try my best to answer this question, first question. In terms of communicating this type of ideal ideology to other students, other people, I used to teach my other students in my school, certain subjects, like system thinking and teaching thinking like that. So, I never teach anyone this yet. I can't imagine how you could teach someone this. <laughs> so, in terms of difficulty, it may be difficult to teach someone else this, I'm trying to explain someone else this, while trying to explain my other multitude of things to get, to, to get a grasp of the situation there. Like the reason why, the reason behind all of the instances that happen in their lives, or may occur in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. It's just hard to put into words how it is. And so rational uh, maybe that conversation though. Yeah, a conversation is probably the best thing to do. Like you can't like have a classroom and just teach someone of this verbatim. Right, well, you get, I think what he's asking, do you and your peers talk about? Oh, mm, no, not very often. <laughs> I usually talk to older peers. He's <laughs> 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 about the only person my age I talk about this. Uh, thank you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would definitely say, well, uh, with the extracurricular activities that I'm involved with, I get a chance to talk about certain things outside, that are outside of schoolwork, um, such as being a um, member, leader of the diversity club at school, um, this is one of the main things that I try to talk about. But I do notice that no matter how hard we try, and unless we're doing something fun or being celebratory um, within our practice, of, unless we're trying to have, uh, if we're trying to have deep conversation, um, I notice that that's when the room kind of loses, uh, we lose attention, and so we lose, um, well yeah, we lose the attention of all of our peers, but as far as the people that I communicate with, well, uh, I mean, I, you know, of course I have friends from school, and then I also have uh, long-term friends from people that I know in my neighborhood, um, and from childhood relationships, uh, and then I also have, you know, KI crew, which of course you'd expect we expect, you know, we, you'd expect we talk about this all the time. And so, <laughs> so as far as kids in my school, is I do talk to maybe two or three of them about it. Um, you know, there have been a couple of that have stated their uh, distaste for my conversation. So, <laughs> so they, huh? The, uh, actually, one of them. Uh, actually, the ones that I talk to that do, uh, that can understand or try, or tr at least trying to understand, are black. Now, of course, that I talk to, there's like one um, white student that gets it or that is trying to get it. Um, but that's 
pretty much it. I mean, I try to talk to all my friends about it, and uh, but yes, there are only a few of them, you know, like two or three, that are really trying to listen. It's not a pretty subject. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not. I'm sorry, what you Quick say? way to lose friends. It's not a pretty subject. That you might lose friends. I said it's a quick way to lose friends. I know. My dad. You know, you were talking about microaggression affecting the image. I, I noticed, you know, I was, I was a photographer and I know the f stop and so forth can either lighten the picture or darken. And I noticed that all black fellas, they put pictures on there where their hair is standing out or they, and it's dark, you know what I'm saying? And many white women look at that. Now I've been in my car driving my wife and we stopped at a stoplight. And a white woman might be next door, man, she reached to, to lock the door. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Like I'm gonna jump out and jump on her. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that, that image is being played all over by black people. And the black fella, his hair is never combed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know when they let him keep combing. I'm saying that image has been portrayed throughout our society. And people are frightened just by living seeing me. As old as I am, I'm a stick. They're afraid. That image that the media portrays, you know, it does affect us, young and old. So that's. You have a question you might ask them today? No, I don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> solution. But in the end, she does point out some possible solutions to discuss about. And one of the solutions I thought about is about getting, removing this idea of colorblindness as, as the main idea of the solution. The idea of colorblindness. As trying to look over the idea of your skin, of your skin color as a means of, who you, of your character. But for what I read, for what I read from the book, all this idea complex is gave people indifference to your race and your identity, make you completely ignorant about everything else about your character, and only be concerned about what's been portrayed about your character. So, with that indifference, you, a person will not try to go any deeper to try to understand about your character about what they've been told. So one of the solutions I believe she stated was um, the idea of racial consciousness. Not being racist in, in a way, not being racist or prejudiced in a way, but being conscious of that person's race, aside from his character. Like, don't take your racist character as a generalization, but use it as a means to make a possible determination of what's going to happen around you. Like, what do you expect from this character? But not just an ignorant understanding of what you've been told. Like, I'm trying to give you an example. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to give you an example to give you some context. Um, like Mr. Ramsey said about a person, that's the idea of an ignorant type of character, an ignorant person trying to give their character through an assumption they made from television. Like, they didn't get to know this person. They just made a general assumption about his character. Mm -hmm. Expect negative, very negative outcomes from him. Mm -hmm. Racial consciousness means you're going to take more than just what you've been told into account. Like, I, I know what I assume certain things from this person, 
But you gotta be critical of what you think about it. Yeah, man. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so, a person like, I, I don't wanna use him as an example. <laughs> when I read that chapter, I thought of him. He's not a racially, he's not a compliant person. He usually takes race in his, in his, in his expectations a lot. But you're dealing with a multitude of people. He has a generalization. He, it's not a generalization, it's just an assumption he makes that he takes into account. He doesn't base his action entirely on it. He lets the person take the action first and see if it's right or wrong. And try to make transitions beyond that. <laughs> Most of the time, he's right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's my, that's my answer. All right, as an order of hands, Miss Fair first, and Miss um, uh, Miss. I was going to remind you, young men, that uh, she said, let us march to the hard work of movement building. She said civil rights is hard won, hard fought. Mm -hmm. Civil rights is empty without human rights. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. And then she started talking about the first step is telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Be bold and courageous. One young woman said, how do you affect the changes to human rights without militancy? And she said militancy is fun. Mm -hmm. If militancy, she says, I'm not one. She says, if militancy means violence, then I'm not there. Okay. She says, but don't water down the truth. If militancy means not compromising, when it's not even necessary. If militancy means courageously speaking yes. out and speaking the truth, she says, please be militant. This was a young woman who said that. And so it was about the hard work of movement building, and we all have that example in the building of the civil rights movement that Martin Luther King got killed right after he went to Tennessee and was starting to organize with our workers. As soon as it started turning into human rights, he was gone. And so it was the hard work of movement building and telling the truth. Make visible what is in, in plain Alright, um, Miss Ruben in the back, and then here up front. I don't know, I'm just going to read the liberating my question. My question actually does touch a little bit on what Ms. Paulette was saying about telling the truth and, to, and owning the story. Uh, that was one of the main things the that they were trying to communicate me, to me this summer was even, you know, the extent of, um, the extent of <coughs> the education system and how even the education <coughs> system um, further perpetuates, um, further, yeah, further perpetuates this, um, <coughs> racist institution and it further perpetuates it and so uh, <coughs> well now I mean in, even in every class like I take some of my books home um, you know and, and have discussions with uh, them about what I learned in class or whatever you know, something that happened and so even I remember one of the specific ones was about uh, I think like Indian art and they were talking about how the, the book was explaining how like the Aryan race created Buddhism and Hinduism and it was, well not Buddhism, uh, Hinduism. <coughs> and from Hinduism came Buddhism. And it didn't give, and then they gave me an entirely different perspective about, um, as you'll see on the Afri chart right there, about tribes that were originally there, that um, were there with the Aryan tribe and how the Aryans took credit for something that had already been established. And not having that in the education system makes it really hard to be in the class and not, you know, not, I'm not gonna, I, I can't just sit there and like, you know, keep my hand down anymore. Um, 
Question everything. Yeah. How do your teachers take to that? <laughs> some of them, some of them don't. <laughs> just kind of, just kind of like an okay, and then moving on. <laughs> That's a terrible teacher, that is. But some of them do try, but some of them do try to get. So I usually have discussions after class. A lot with a lot of them end up being with my uh, philosophy and English teachers. Of course. Uh, so, um, you know, now of course they're. Well, I mean, I'm glad that they're both good teachers, so that they are more receptive. But you know, as far as like the history teacher goes, it's like, you know, they don't want to be kind of you talking, yeah, what are you, you know, what are you trying to tell me about history? Like, you know, it's it's written, it's in stone, it's That's but you know, history, yeah, exactly. And so, you now luckily, my philosophy and English teachers are very receptive to what I have to say. And uh, usually they let me speak my piece, and then they'll even challenge me on my view, so that I have to elaborate more for my classmates. So it allows for more the spreading of the well. Good, good practice. Uh, and so I do appreciate I do appreciate them for that, but it, I do notice that it's uh, that you can't just I can't just keep my hand down anymore. Um, I think we got I got asked the same question last uh, when we did an, when we did the Trayvon Martin Forum, and to be completely honest, um, I don't have uh, an answer. Um, I know that small, I know that there are certain ways of you know uh, of what we do of having a space where people can be open and come talk about what they feel is very important, and I've noticed that that has been. Uh, very effective and very helpful. And then, you know, uh, when those people go back to whatever they own, whatever they do, such as even myself, you know, during the day when I go back to school, then that's then that truth is still being spread. Um, but as far as what you can do, I'm not uh, sure if I have a clear enough answer for it. Yeah. Uh, well, I like that. The, uh, this meeting today is a clear example power of our ability to do without corporate interest or corporate interference. This stuff we've done on our own, self-reliance, self-determination, and a form of resilience. Uh, what is 25, 30 people in the room on Saturday afternoon talking about yeah. the new Jim Crow. So that may seem to be small, a small matter, but it's actually a very powerful 
course of action has been taken. We've got two 17-year-olds who've been real impressive with um, uh, struggling and grappling with some, some rather challenging uh, ideas. And, and you know, as King already said, have this, this period that's right here. Right. And Rasul, in a very polite way, said, you don't have any peers. Other than the old people, the old people.
I don't know. Well, the prosecutor now can get so much stuff on those kids. But, but the important thing you're saying is that you're taking action. Yeah. 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 You gotta take and, action. And, you and, can't and, just and, keep yeah. on talking. Well, hold on. The, but the talk is important too, because what you've done today by sharing, as right. yeah. you share with others, there is something you can do. Yeah. Here's what I did. Here's what course of action I've taken with my son to allow him to move his life forward. So the conversation is important because if you had not shared, we would not have known. And my son and reaches down, he tried to catch someone they so, so like I, his age. Yeah, and so I'm saying, and, and, and now your son is actually doing mm -hmm. what others need to do, but it's important that we share and communicate. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we just don't think we can do anything, right. and we can. Yeah. And that's what one of the real important things is about gathering and, and talking with each other about possibilities. Right. And I'm glad you share. Discussion, you discussion is a tool for action. Exactly. Thank you. 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 Would encourage you to do so. Then the other thing here, this facility over the years has provided so much for young That's men true. to 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 find themselves. Oh, and, and 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 uh, it needs to be continued to be supported, self-sustained. Now, as a stakeholder, I see propaganda coming down the pipeline. And it's coming down through crimes that's being committed by our young brothers. The home invasion mm -hmm. has stimulated racism to its highest mm -hmm. in, in terms of buying guns, mm -hmm. in terms of being flashed continuously on TV. These faces of these young men that you need to be scared of. Uh, looking at the young sister that her face was blown off, asking for help. So it, it sends a signal, a signal being sent, incarceration, mass incarceration increasing by the public, by those offenders. So. As we sit here in discussion, we still need to somehow find out how to reach these young people who are not using intelligence. Now, is it is it because of what we have placed in terms of materialistic things that value more than self-esteem and respect as a group of as a people? I'm not sure, but it's something that I'm very concerned with. And uh, hope it's going to be more discussion for more people. So the only thing I can say is for y'all to keep on doing what you're doing. And I got $20 for you right now. <laughs> One problem with the terminology white supremacy and white privilege, and I think is that I think that's overgeneralization. There are a lot of poor and struggling whites. Uh, you know, there are you know, and when the African people talk about ninety nine percent, that's an awful lot of whites in that too. You know, the one you know, the, the one you know, you know the one percent doesn't represent all whites, and I think also a lot of whites uh, have been. Uh, you know, have been involved in social justice movements, our people of conscience, uh, and that even those lower middle class, working class whites, uh, including myself, a college graduate, who's actually lived in poverty because I can't find a, I can't find a job because I'm either this or that. Uh, you know, so uh, I don't think, I think, somehow I think white supremacy as uh, applied to whites generally or across the board, I think is a gross it's, it's simplification uh, which you know, I personally find insulting because uh, you know. But that's all I'm going to say on that. And I like your response. Okay. Maybe especially from the uh, white professor.
different economic classes of whites. You know, there are poor whites, middle class whites, upper income whites, and certainly most whites do not, are not participants in what you might call the power elite. Uh, and it, there's definitely class oppression, you know, and uh, negative or oppressive discourses around class. Um, at the, I also think it's important, as I think these two young men discussed earlier, is that we see the power elite doing political manipulations mm -hmm. to separate low-income whites from African Americans, Latinos. You know that uh, the power elite got very frightened when Martin Luther King moved from just racial issues to socioeconomic issues and to the Vietnam War issues. Um, there's a lot of effort by the power elite to capture whites' attitudes to be negative toward African Americans. In fact, I would say a lot of this effort, and you can see this in the Reagan and in the Nixon campaigns and the campaigns of others to divide people because if they start getting together, then the power elite's going to lose a lot of its power. So I think one of the bill of goods, you could say, that gets sold to even low-income whites is at least we're better than black people, you know. Uh, so I think uh, white supremacy is a complex construct uh, that gets sold to people. It's, I don't think when, you, when people say white supremacy, they're, not, they're saying there isn't a low income group of whites. And I don't think it's saying that that group doesn't experience oppression itself. But I think instead what they're saying is that um, what gets communicated generally in society, what some people call the dominant discourse or the master narrative, is that even if you're poor white, there's somebody that's got less than you do. Another part of it, I think, is we have lots of research. So, so even if a low-income white and a low-income black apply for the same job, the low-income white, on average, not every time, but on average, is going to get the job over the black person. There's, there's, a, there's a discourse out there that that's not what's happening, that that blacks are getting the jobs, and that's just not true. Another good example is on uh, getting loans to buy houses. You can have a low-income white couple with the same resources as a low-income black couple, and on average, the low-income white couple will get the loan, and when they get the loan, they'll get a better percent. So I think what the white supremacy is saying, it's not saying that there isn't oppression of low-income whites. It's saying that the system, when low-income whites and low-income blacks are compared to low-income whites on average, and this doesn't mean every case, just on average, gets the better opportunity. So I think it's about a system. It's not about the many whites aren't oppressed. And I think the, the goal of that system is to keep low-income whites, low-income blacks, low-income Latinos separated and fighting each other. Because if, I, if I'm in a power position and I can keep those in a lesser position fighting each other, that's dollars for me. 
You know, that's more power for me. And I think that's what it's about. So I, I think we have to be very difficult, I mean, very careful about how we understand that concept of white supremacy. All right. Oh, that's my here. white professor answer. <laughs> All right, sir. You know, we have uh, many communication skills today, uh, tools today. Blogs. You also have Facebook, you know, where you, I mean, that's a beautiful presentation where you can present the views that you've given on live. I know this person because I had a Christian blog myself. My daughter helped us get together and my son in law. So you can do that. You can reach people that want to read it. You know what I'm saying? That's about the best way, because you know the, the media, I mean, like the television, not going to do it, and neither the newspaper. So you got those tools, you know, well, what you did. The KI Echo Center has been drawing me into this <laughs> blogging and they YouTube. I even want to come in this area. They'll be there. All right, yeah. Uh, it's 10 till 2. Uh, I'm going to wrap up about the block, folks. We're welcome to, to stay after, kick them around. Uh, so if you guys got one or two more questions, I guess we'll take those. I do want to make one small presentation, and that is the Eagle Center is a self-funded 501c3, which means we can do this because you guys help support us do this. So how, how can we help? Well, one, you can just give money, like was just demonstrated earlier. A former back. Uh, we take cash, of course, <laughs> and check. Uh, so that's one option. Another one is we have what we call a private enterprise. Is Cabinet Media still in the house? He's not behind you. Uh, behind us here is our flagship social enterprise, web design, social media, graphic design. That's why you don't see these guys much because they're in that room back there getting the bills paid. They're working, as others will share, share with you, competitive with others. You see Academy, so that must be Academy at work. So uh, you can support it by either your organization or place you know that needs service to spread the word. Hey, I know this great company that does great work and doing great uh, computer type work, but also doing great work for the community. Uh, Eco Fashion's in the house. I'm sure we've got some Eco Fashion bags around. Um, Feel free to purchase one of those bags. I express yourself rain barrels, uh, where we are manufacturing rain barrels, intergenerational initiative. And through these enterprises, uh, we are trying to demonstrate self-reliance and self-determination by starting where you are, what you have. Now, of course, you can just give money. And for you big balls in the house, December is coming up. You look at those tax write-offs and spread on your total of 501c3, we can give you a uh, tax uh, a form for that. So one of the ways we're able to maintain our independent voice is that philosophically we're trying to make sure that our funding stream is balanced enough so that if we say something other folks don't like and then the dollars just happen to disappear and don't get refunded next year, we still can still come in and do what we want and, and save the things that need to be said or as uh, Michelle said, be bold and courageous. So please don't forget us on that lens. Uh, we'll take a few more questions. Our goal with this text is to have these two young men lead us through the whole book for the next several months, chapter by chapter. Uh, I would like to challenge each of, each of you guys and, and, and also your young people to bring at least one, one young person with you. And you know, a lot of times young people not trying to hear us talk. But they see their, their peers talking, it, it helps engage that conversation and helps, I think, reduce some of the social fear about being intellectual and being scholarly. That, you know, you can, you can you keep your game face on and, and know something and talk about things that, that are relevant and important. So I'd like to challenge everyone to consider bringing someone else, one of your relatives or friend of yours. And sometimes you just have to pay it. Look, come on over here, I'm going to eat this <laughs>
Any questions? Let's just get it down to the